Thank you, and thank you all for coming today. As, as Nancy said, the, <clears throat> the aim of these lectures is to, well, for me to do two things. One is to just cover a few of the things that you're going to be learning about and working on in your GCSE science, just a few of the topics that we thought were, were interesting and you would perhaps want a, a little bit more depth, a little bit more detail about. Um, topics like the, the formation of the moon, uh, topics like the, the Earth's magnetic field and what it does for us and how it creates the, the northern lights. And also uh, going all the way back to the start of the universe, the Big Bang. So, so what is the evidence for the Big Bang? What was it? When did it happen? But most crucially, how do we know? Because those, these things that I'm saying, like how did the moon uh, begin? How was the moon created? How was the universe created? They sound like questions that are incredibly difficult to go about answering, and indeed they are difficult questions to answer. So all the way through this lecture, and I think all the way through your science careers, which I hope will be long, I hope many of you will want to become scientists, I think it's worth always bearing in mind that it's an astonishing thing. That these are astonishing facts that we've learned. And the way that we learned them is probably, well, I would say certainly more important than remembering those facts. So I will keep referring to that all the way through the talk. You know, how did we know that? Uh, what is the process that led us to these astonishing conclusions? And just to kind of whet your appetite, it's worth thinking about the journey that we've made to understanding these things throughout human history, you know, even beginning to talk about things like when did the universe begin, how did it begin, how big is the universe, astonishing questions. Because our oldest known ancestors, so the, the first footprints of hominids, actually before our species had evolved, but the first things that walked upright that looked a bit like us, were found, well, they're only three and a half million years old. Uh, these are the footprints that were found in Tanzania, uh, the earliest known hominid footprints are uh, frozen solid, essentially, in, in mud, in concrete, as it were, in the plains of Africa. Three and a half million years ago. Now, the Earth is just over four and a half billion years old. So that's a fraction of the age of the Earth, that the first things that looked like us started to walk, and then our species subsequently evolved, and only three and a half million years later left a footprint for the first time on another world. So it's that journey all the way through this talk. I'd like to talk a little bit about that. How is it that these things that were essentially, um, I don't know, almost monkeys, chimpanzees, just animals three and a half million years ago, got to the point where they could leave a footprint on another world in just three and a half million years? And actually, it's rather faster than that because modern science, this, this thing that I want to talk about today, only really began, I suppose, in the what, let's say 500 years ago, maybe 400 years ago. Um, only, well, 100 years ago, for example, we learned how to fly for the first time, 1903, the first powered flight. And we went from the first powered flight to the rocket that took us to leave that footprint on the moon in one human lifetime, 70 years. And so I think that story, the story of how we go about doing things like that, how we progress so quickly, is incredibly important and valuable. So I said that I was going to talk about a few things that I know you do at GCSE that are, that are interesting and really illustrate the, that story, illustrate that, the power of science, the power of thought and experiment. Um, this is one of them, the origin of the moon. So you could ask the question, where did our moon come from? How would you go about answering that question? Well, this is a a tremendous picture, uh, I think. It's taken by a space probe called Deep Impact that was actually flying off to go and crash, literally crash into a comet to see what comets are made of. But on its way, it turned around and took these four pictures of the Earth and the Moon. And there are some unusual things about the Earth's Moon that really set us on this journey to understanding where it came from. One of them you can see beautifully, vividly in this picture, and that is it's very big compared to the Earth. And I think this is the best picture I've ever seen to illustrate that. It's one of the biggest moons in the solar system. And compared to the planet it orbits, the Earth, it is by far the biggest in relative size terms. And this is a, a picture of, well, moons and one planet of the solar system to scale. Right? So the biggest moon of the solar system is Ganymede, 
which is a moon of Jupiter, an astonishing place in itself. It's this one here. We actually think there's a liquid water ocean underneath the surface of Ganymede. It's so big, it has a magnetic field like the Earth. It has a thin atmosphere and water below the surface, which may make it one of the places where we might find life beyond the Earth, be that only small single cell life. That's the biggest moon in the solar system. Next biggest is the moon Titan, the moon of Saturn, which has an incredibly dense atmosphere. We've landed on that moon and we found, if you watch Wonders of the Solar System, you'll remember we found lakes and rain and ice, but lakes of liquid methane instead of water because it's a cold, frozen place with a dense atmosphere. Next is not a moon at all, it's a planet. So that's planet Mercury, which is actually smaller than these two moons. Then a moon called Callisto, and a moon called Io around Jupiter, the most volcanic place in the solar system, and then our moon, which is just a bit bigger than another moon of Jupiter called Europa. So it's one of the biggest objects in the solar system. It's almost as big as the planet Mercury and very big compared to the Earth. That's the first thing you notice about the moon. So you might ask the question, how did the Earth and moon form like that? Why are the two things that are, you know, on a cosmological scale of things, roughly the same size, orbiting around each other. But there are some other facts that are interesting about the Earth and the Moon. Now, this is a beautiful picture, actually, I just wanted to show, taken from orbit around planet Mars by a space probe just a couple of years ago. So this is the view of the Earth and the Moon looking back from Mars. One of the very interesting things about the Moon is that it's got very little iron in its core. Now, the Earth, as we'll see a little bit later on, has got a lot of iron in its core, which is actually responsible for its magnetic field. The Moon seems to have very little, very little compared to the other planets and many of the moons in the solar system. So that's a, a puzzle. If it formed in the same place as the Earth, then why has the Earth got a lot of iron in its core and the Moon has got very little? The other thing, and this is one of the big words that I want to use, but it's got a simple explanation, is there's a lot of spin in the Earth and the Moon system. The, the Moon is very big compared to the Earth. It orbits around the Moon very fast. The Earth spins and the Moon spins. And one of the fundamental <coughs> principles of physics, one of the fundamental principles of science, is that spin, this thing called angular momentum, doesn't just get invented. It has to come from somewhere. So when you see something spinning very fast, like the Earth and the Moon system with the Moon flying around the Earth, you need an explanation for that. Why is there so much angular momentum? Why is there so much spin? We also went to the moon, as I mentioned earlier, I think one of the greatest achievements in human history back in 1969, when I was about one year old, actually, so a long time ago. But we went there, we got moon rocks, and we brought them back. We found that the composition of the moon rocks is very, very similar to the Earth. Right? So the rocks seem to have come from roughly the same source, but by looking at the way that little radioactive atoms, radioactive elements in the rocks decay, we can date them very accurately. And it looks like they're about 30 to 50 million years younger. Now that's not very much younger because we know from dating the Earth and dating the whole formation of the solar system that the Earth was born about four and a half billion years ago. So 30 to 50 million doesn't seem like much, but we can date rocks that accurately. So that seems to suggest the Moon was formed very slightly after the Earth. And then there's one more interesting thing. I know that some of you will have learned about isotopes of different elements, which if you get an element like carbon, for example, which has six protons and six neutrons in it, that's called carbon-12 because it's got 12 protons and neutrons all put together. You can also have a thing called carbon-14, which has six protons and eight neutrons. That's called a different isotope. Same for oxygen. And in fact, it turns out that the ratio of these different forms of oxygen in rocks is very sensitive. It can be very sensitively measured. And at different places in the solar system, uh, when planets form closer to the sun or further away from the sun, you find different ratios of these things. But on the Earth and the Moon, you find that those ratios are very similar. And it's very precise. So we've got this picture and a bit of a puzzle. The Moon is a bit younger than the Earth. It's spinning very quickly. It's made of very closely the same stuff as the Earth, the very similar stuff, but there's very little iron in it. So what's the explanation for that? Well, there is a theory which is pretty widely accepted 
which explains all those things. Some people question the theory, and this is why I think it's a beautiful example of the way you do science, because it's not 100% correct, it's not 100% accepted, but it works. And it's beautifully illustrated by this beautiful picture, actually. What we think happened is that very early on in the formation of the solar system, so let's say <laughs> 50 million years after the Earth formed, there was another planet very close to the Earth, about the size of Mars. And the theory goes that this planet <laughs> hit the Earth in a glancing blow. Now, think what that would do. So you hit the Earth in a glancing blow. You knock off loads of bits of the Earth, but not the centre of the Earth. Now, when planets form, the heavy things drift towards the centre of the planet. And that's why all the iron, or most of the iron in the Earth, sits at its core. There would have been enough time for that to happen. And so when this collision happened, the bits that got knocked off were not very rich in iron because all the iron was sat in the middle of the Earth. That then knocks loads of bits off. Also, because it was a glancing blow, it puts loads of spin into the system. It's just like kicking a football at the edge, and it spins and curves. Right? You smash something across the edge of the Earth, and you put a lot of spin in, which accounts for the spin. It also accounts for why the rocks <laughs> seem to be the same, because the moon is indeed made of bits of the Earth, so the same isotope contents. And because it happened 50 million years after the Earth formed, it explains why the radioactive clocks on the Moon are a little bit younger. So I think that's a beautiful example of a theory. It seems that the Moon indeed did form in a planetary collision about 50 million years after the Earth was formed. Um, and all the evidence points to that because of these four things that we've observed about the Earth and the Moon, and because we went there and got bits of the Moon, analysed them in the lab.